speaking to me over the phone on this commentary that the narrative is very interesting but does not gel with the personality of Kura Tadwa as we know him because he seems to be contentious arguing with the Lord which he would not necessarily do. If he had only associated with Aam Tadwa I would have accepted it or even if it is Parasara Bhattara I could accept it because there are people who could talk to God, challenge to God, ask him questions. The point here is to be noted that what I was speaking there was something which is dependent upon the interpretation that we give to it. Any statement not only states a fact, it actually structures a fact. Stating a fact is giving you merely the meaning of the sentence. There will be ambiguity in it. There will be other suggestions or what you call semiotic layers by semiotic we mean signal words not only give a meaning they also signal certain meanings depending upon that we will have to understand what the statement means the efficacy of the statement there is that it is not to show that Koratarva was challenging God but that he was only making it possible for us to understand how great the devotion to the feet of the Guru is of the Acharya is I am reminded of a very interesting passage from one of the English epics. In Paradise Class there is one passage where Satan appears before Adam and Eve and looking at Eve he forgets himself. Milton says, when he looked at Eve he forgot himself. She fair, divinely fair, fit love for gods, not terrible, though terror be in love when not approach with proper gate, which way now I tend. That's what he says. And next moment he adds that one moment the evil one stood the stupidly good. Critics have analyzed this statement. For that one moment the evil one stood the stupidly good. The evil one, the personification of evil, that is Satan. He is the equivalent of evil. If you give a physical form to evil, it will be Satan. But even that evil one for a moment stood stupidly good. Therefore, there is a possibility of goodness in Satan. So Milton unconsciously is on the side of Satan. This is the argument they arrive at. No one can ever imagine this. We have to approach it in a slightly different way. He wants to impress that the personality of Eve was so surpassingly beautiful that even Satan forgot. So it is not to show that Satan was good but it's only to know that he was surpassingly beautiful. In a similar sense, we have to take this. This is not to show that Kuratarva was challenging God, but that if you attain to the feet of the Guru or the Acharya, if you surrender the feet of Acharya, this Yacharya, when once you do it, you are sure of moksha, there is no return from it, and even God cannot help it. So it is in this context. Now you see how a possible misconception is cleared because of a certain interpretation. Ramanuja excelled in this kind of interpretation. That is why when Mr. Dayanand asked me what the topic of this lecture would be, I said it is the interpretative and commentarial genius of Ramanuja. The interpretative, commentarial. These two words have to be very clearly understood. Commentarial is exegetic, whereas interpretative, it is also sometimes used as interpretive, it is hermeneutic. I will explain these two terms so that what we are going to say later will be pellucid. When you interpret, 
you give the meaning of it, you say what it means. That is interpretation. It is done according to tradition. That is why you use the word hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation based upon traditional principles. Commentary, which is exegesis, commentary is elaborating upon what has been said in order to bring out all its ramifications, all the suggestions therein. There is also another difference. When it is hermeneutic, what you say negates what has been said earlier. Whereas in commentary, what you say now is only an extension of what has been said. It adds to rather than take away from. These two principles are involved in what is today known in literary criticism as deconstruction. In deconstruction, Derrida says that you deconstruct and thereby take the meaning from one level to the other level. Or, he says, there is a postponement of meaning. You have one meaning, you come to it, read it again, you get another meaning, like that you go on postponing the meaning or deferring the meaning. There is a postponement of meaning. Now, there is one point here. If you postpone the meaning, will you ever arrive at the end? That is one thing. Secondly, if there is a postponement of meaning, what happens to earlier meanings? In hermeneutics, I said, it gets negated. In exegesis, it does not get negated. It only gets modified. Or in other words, one statement added to another, added to another, added to another, comes to be the sum total of all the meanings that have been given to it. This is what we call the deference of meaning or the postponement of meaning. This postponement, based upon, as I told you, deconstruction functions on four principles. One is the text. The other is the context. The third is the intertext. The fourth is the cortext. Text is what it actually means. That is grammatical or syntactic. This is a subject. This is a predicate. This is the object. This qualifies. This modifies. Therefore, this is what it is. So, it is purely a grammatical analysis. That is text. Now, your sentence is not exhausted by its grammatical implication alone. Grammatically correct sentences may not communicate if the appropriate words are not there. Secondly, if appropriate words are there but not grammatically poised, then also it will not communicate. Therefore, we have to strike a balance between these two. That is where the structure comes in. So, we have got the text and then we have got the way in which the text has been constructed. It is not enough because a sentence in itself does not have a meaning just as a word does not have a meaning in itself. A meaning for a word is fixed by the context in which it is used. In a similar way, a sentence also takes its meaning by its context. A sentence alone in isolation may not mean anything. It may even mean something which cannot be accepted. A number of examples can be suggested. It is said that Wittgenstein made one statement. A paper should not be longer than five minutes. A paper should not be longer than five minutes. What does it mean? How can a paper be measured in terms of minutes? And then paper is a material now. A paper, how do you have an article before a material now? You don't say a gold. You can say a gold instrument, ornament. You can say gold instrument. Can you say a gold? Therefore, grammatically it is not right. And then measuring the length of a paper well, in terms of what? Five minutes. Except in Einsteinian dimensions, I think distance cannot be measured in time. Then what does this mean? He says, the context of the sentence alone will give you the meaning. What is the context? The context is that he was reading a paper at an academic session. So, your paper is an academic paper. The length of the paper is the duration during which, the time during which it can be presented. Therefore, it is the context that gives the meaning to other otherwise seemingly absurd sentence. A paper cannot be longer than five minutes. In a similar way, there is the text, there is the context. Beyond that, there is an intertext. Intertextuality is very important in interpretation because when you use a particular word, you choose that word or it chooses itself depending upon the inspiration that the author has. That word in that particular context has got a particular significance. The significance is enhanced 
are intensified when you are able to see that word being used in some other context, in some other work of art, in some other context. Or in other words, when you use an illusion. An illusion refers to something else and when you read that particular word here, this word interacts with that word and enhances its meaning. Take for example, something like that. He is playful like Krishna. Suppose I say, playful like Krishna, he is playful is enough. When you bring in the word Krishna, it is able to introduce into it because of its intertextuality, the cosmic play of Krishna, the mischief of Krishna, the way in which his play itself became meaningful, and therefore when you use the word he is playful like Krishna, it is not the same as saying he is playful. If you say he is playful, it means he is mischievous. When you say he is playful as Krishna, the mischievousness of it takes on a certain divine importance. That is what you call intertextuality. Has it been used elsewhere? What is the meaning there? How does that meaning superimpose upon this particular context enhance the meaning? That is how you bring in the intertext. Beyond all these things, there is the most important thing, which is the most important so far Ramanuja is concerned, we are going to take it now, where you say it is the core text, or sometimes they call it the subtext. What is the core text? Core text is the text that you bring to interpret a particular sentence. A text that I bring, after I am interpreting a text, what is the text that I bring? You see, you can understand the thing only in the context of something. When I read something, I understand it, deconstructing it, putting the different elements of it into different pigeon holes in my mind. What you say is understood, classified and stored in my memory. That is, the classification and the storing, the categorization, the labeling, all these things are based upon my attitude to that. My education, my upbringing, my philosophy, my reading, my all the other things, psychological, sociological, ethical, philosophical, religious, all these things they go into me because I am not an individual in abstract sense. I am a product of a system, you are a product of a culture, you are a product of an inheritance, you are a product of a sampradaya. That comes into me. Only in the light of this, my interpretation of it will become correct. That is why mere text is not enough, context is not enough, they are essential. They give their own meaning. But these meanings become meaningful only when you bring in the last one which is the core text. So the text, the context, the intertext and ultimately the core text. There is also another thing which is important in this, what Derrida calls the reversal of hierarchy. Hierarchy is a structure or a system, one above the other. You say deputy collector and then the collector and so on. In a similar way, there is hierarchy in sentences, in statements, in facts, in everything. Let us take one example. There is a sequence in whatever we do, whatever we see. The sequence is important for understanding it. And if you change the sequence, the significance itself will change. A certain example will help us. We speak about cause and effect. Cause goes before, effect follows. So, cause comes first, the effect follows. There is a stone, I hurl the stone like glass pane, as a window pane, the window pane breaks. Now, the cause is the stone, the result is the broken pane. The cause is first, the pane, the broken pane, or the result is next. Well, what you say is right, but I don't look up on every stone I find on the road as the cause for breaking a pan. I see the pain, the pain is broken, therefore there must be a cause for it. I find a stone lying there and therefore that is the effect, this is the cause. I first understand the cause and then the effect. But now I see the result and then come to the cause. Is there not an inversion of hierarchy? Then you may ask me, then what is the meaning of cause-effect relationship? Here is, this is where we have to see that there are two aspects to it. One is the epistemological, the other is the ontological. Ontological is the fact as it is in itself. Epistemological is as I understand it. So epistemologically, that is the process of knowing, effect comes first, cause follows. Ontologically, cause is first, the effect follows. 
So this is what you call inversion. The hierarchy is inverted. In Ramanuja also this happens because usually the hierarchy is the word and meaning. In Ramanuja, the meaning comes first, the word follows. He is turning the expression as well upon his head and make it mean what he wants it to mean. So, these are the peculiarities which are there in the interpretative or in the commentarial genius of Ramanuja. You may ask him, this is all theory. Can you illustrate it with an example or two? Yes, we have any number of them, but the most common things are the three which are referred to in the life of Ramanuja when he was a student under Yadav Prakasa at Tirupakuri. One day, Yadav Prakasa himself was a very great scholar. He was a Sankarite, but not fully a Sankarite, because he made a certain modification. It is known as Yadaviya Siddhanta. Yadava, Yadav Prakasa, he was following Shankara. Shankara was upon the principle of illusion. Everything is Maya, Mitya, Brahma Satyam, Jigan Mitya, Jeevo Brahma Ivan Abaraha. That is true. This is unreal. And there is nothing outside Brahma. This is the usual thing. Secondly, he speaks of Nirguna Brahma. And even when he speaks about the truth or Satyam, he says there are different levels of Satyam. Vyavaharika Satyam, Rajavasika Satyam, Paramatriya Satyam, three different things. Now, one day, when Ramanuja was giving an oil bath to his master, master was seated, he was there bending over his master and applying hair oil to his head. At that time, Yadav Prakasa happened to speak about the qualities of Brahma. Then he took the famous statement, Kapyasam Kundalika Meva Makshani. It is very simple, Kapyasam, the asana of the Kapi, that is the nades of the monkey. Kundalika Meva Akshani, the eyes of the Parma Purusha, the lotus-like eyes of the Parma Purusha are red like the nades of a monkey. That's what he said. See, there are two adjectives. One is Kapyasam, the other is Kundalika Meva. For Kapyasam, the redness is the attribute. For Kundarikam, Kapyasam is the attribute. So the eyes of the Lord are like a lotus, which is red like the nades of a monkey. Ramanaja could not bear this. What uncouth description. How can you compare the eyes of the Paramapurusha, Pushkaraksha, one who is there, the Rajiva Lochana? How can you compare that to the Prashtabhaga of a monkey? Well, he could not bear this, he shed tears. The tears scalded the thigh of the master. He looked up. Well, why do you cry? I cannot bear to hear what you have said. That's what everybody has said. Dharmadacharya has said that. Are you better than Dharmadacharya? If you have got anything, tell me. Ramanuja's genius you are able to see here. He says, you are wrong in interpreting the word Kapyasam. Kam jalam pipati iti kapihi, suryaha. Asaha is blossom. Kundarika meva is it. Kam jalam pipati kapihi. Kapi is not monkey. No, Kapi is the monkey. Well, I am not now using the Vigraha Vakya, I am using a Lakshana Vakya. Vigraha Vakya is only etymological. Lakshana Vakya is definitive. So I say, Kam Jalam Pipati Iti Kapihi. He who drinks the water, Kam Jalam Pipati Iti Kapihi. Therefore, Kapi means one who drinks the water, or one who sucks the water, or one who makes the water evaporate, and therefore it is the sun. So, Kam Jalam Pipati Kapihi is the sun. Asaha is blossom. Kundalikam is a red lotus. The red lotus which blossoms, Asaha, you are many, blossoms when? When the light of the sun falls upon it. So, Kam Jalam Pipati Tikapihi actually means the eyes of the Lord are red like the lotus which blossoms at the arrival of the sun. So beautiful. But, Yadav Prakasa could not digest this fact. All of us know what happened later. On another occasion, 
ఇట్ వాస్ సర్వం కల్విదం బ్రహ్మ నేహన నాస్తి కించన ఆల్ ఓవర్ సిక్స్ స్టేట్మెంట్స్ ఎవ్రీథింగ్ ఈజ్ వెరీలీ బ్రహ్మన్ దెర్ ఇస్ నో డిఫరెన్స్ వాట్ సో ఎవర్ దట్ ఇస్ ఎ లిటరల్ మీ ఎవ్రీథింగ్ ఈజ్ వెరీలీ బ్రహ్మన్ దెర్ ఇస్ నో డిఫరెన్స్ వాట్ సో ఎవర్ దెర్ ఇస్ ఓన్లీ బ్రహ్మన్ దెర్ ఇస్ నథింగ్ ఎల్స్ హౌ కెన్ దిస్ బీ దెర్ ఇస్ ద వర్డ్ ద వర్డ్ ఇస్ మిత్య if you have mithya there are so many questions to be answered if it is like a reflection well where is the mirror on which it is reflected and where do you place the mirror who is the perceiver of the reflection is the reflection true or is the person true or is the locus that is true do they belong to different levels of truth can you have different levels of truth there will be a bigger truth there will be a smaller truth but not there will be a true and untrue truth can there be untrue truth that he said sarvam kalidam brahma nehana nasti kinta well explain how can you explain that he says everything is brahman sarvam kalidam brahma there is no difference whatsoever then do you mean to say that the evanescent world the ever changing world He is Paramatma, he is Brahma. Well, Upanishads have proclaimed it again and again. I am Atma Brahma, I am Prithvi Brahma. Everything before he is Brahma, that's what I have said. But you say that these are not real and that the reality is in only in Brahma, that is the only reality. He says, look at this. You say it is a projection. Projection has got two aspects. One is Avarana, the other is Vivartha. Avarana is concealing vivartha is projecting what maya does is it conceals the real and projects the unreal i am not contributing to that view at all i am speaking of the evolution and the involution brahma vivartha brahma parimana you speak of brahma vivartha vada i speak of brahma parinama vada that is look at this there is a fish the fish is in the water it is born in the water it lives in the water it dies in the water it dissolves in the water but the fish is not water in a similar way the universe is in god he is born out of him he is sustained by him he dissolves in him and disappears into him do you say the fish is water then how can you say that this is he or he is this well that was the second shock there is another which is much more difficult than all this the first one perhaps is uh, dependent upon vocabulary the second upon a kind of illustrative logic the third where you speak about the guna and the guni the attribute and the thing to which it is attributed how are they related satyam jnanam anantam brahma simple satyam jnanam anantam he is brahma the quality is brahma well you speak of a brahman without quality it is only nirguna brahman it is only when there is vikalpa you are able to see this nirvikalpa means brahman nirvikalpa means you no change at all therefore you know, there is no attribute it is nirvisesha but you says satyam jnanam anantam brahman that is what the upanishad says but you say it is nirvikalpa how can you explain this to explain this you have to think of these qualities as constituting brahman and not as attributes of brahman unless there is an attribute you cannot know an object or you know the cow by its cowness you know wood by its woodness woodness is a quality the quality inheres in the wood you cannot know the wood without the quality and you cannot extract the quality of oh, those you see this is woodness and when this woodness qualifies that object it becomes wood no it is not so at all unless there is an attribute unless there is a qualification you cannot understand it so there is no perception of an attribute in an object if you say sarvam kalvidam brahma okay if you say satyam nanam anantam brahma these must be attributes therefore there is one brahman that brahman can be perceived only through the attributes therefore there cannot be a nirvisesha brahman there can only be a savisesha brahman there can only be a saguna brahman well it's rather logically difficult to explain take for example 
I ask you to get, get me some water to drink. How do you get it? You get it in a glass or tumbler or cup. Can that be water without the cup, without a container? In a similar way, can there be the quality without one to which it is an attribute? Unless there is an attribute, you cannot understand it. No, water is tasteless. Tastelessness is the taste of water. You may not be able to taste it in the sense that you are not able to find its taste on your tongue. But don't you feel it? You know, you speak about the gradations. When you begin with agasha, and then come to air, and then come to fire, and then come to water, and then come to earth. The first one has only one, the second has two. Akasa, Vayuhu, Vayur, Agnihi, Agni, Rabaha, Abha, Prithvi. In Prithvi, five. Before that, in water, four. Four things are there. Taste, tasteless is taste of water for one thing. If it is not felt by the tongue, are you not able to feel it? When you pour it on your hand, don't you feel the cold? When you touch it, don't you find, find its uh, a pneumatic nature? Then how can you say that water is tasteless? No, no, it is the absence of taste. Yes. You can explain Brahman also in the same way. He is Akileheya Pratyanika. One who does not have any of the attributes of Prakriti. Well, if you does not have the attributes of Prakriti, how do you account for so many evil things that are there in it? You say he is Satyam, Jnanam, Anartam, Brahma. Is there not Asatyam in the world? Is there not ignorance in the world? Are not the things in the world limited? Satyam, Jnanam, Anartam. Asatyam, Ajnanam, limited, everything is there. How do you account for these things? There you have to bring in how it is not a total absence of perception, but a perception by an intellect which is limited. It is in a state of Sankoja. Sankoja Jnana. When you realize Brahman, it becomes Vikasa Jnana. Sankoja is knowing it as it is, as you are able to perceive it with the limited things that have been given to you. Look at this example. Unless there is light, you can't see the objects. When you drive a car, car during the night, the man in the opposite direction, he comes with his light, very bright and dazzling. In the light you must be able to see, but you are not able to see. You are not able to see in light, but you say you can see only in light. How do you account for it? Because your sense organs are not attuned to the reading of that object in that light. The limitation is not in the light. The limitation is in your organs of perception. Therefore, the limitation is in your perception. It is not in the light or the medium which gives you that. Similarly, certain sounds are below a certain decibel level. Some of them are beyond. Beyond and below we are not able to hear. It does not mean that it not exist. You speak about ultrasonic. You speak about infrasonic. It is because you are not able to hear. Can you say it is not there? Therefore, you have to go a bit beyond this transactional logic. In transaction logic, you speak about Pratyaksham and Anuman. Pratyaksham and Anuman do not exist, exhaust everything. Some of the things which are not perceptible. Are you able to see the germs in the wind, in the air around you? Or the bacteria in the water? It does not that they do not exist. We are not able to see. Similarly, we are not able to hear certain things. It does not mean they do not exist. Where is the solution? Certain things have to be understood only in the light of the pramanas. Pramanic statements. What you may call axioms if you want. See, logic is structured only upon certain underlying principles which are assumptions. If you change the assumption, the entire logical structure comes crashing down. It is like a pack of cards. So, the logical structure, which is subject to the vagaries of the argumentation, as Sankara himself has said, no amount of argument will be able to prove the opposite of experience. Experience is everything. Pramanas are experience. We speak about Sabda Pramana. Words as testimony, or what you call verbal testimony. You may call the Vedas. And then the Vedanta are the Upanishads. Then the Bhagavad Gita and then the Sariraka Sastra or Bhadrayana Sutras. It is for the Sutra 
that Ramanuja had written that big commentary which goes by the name of Srivasya and it is this commentary which brings out the commentarial excellence of Ramanuja's genius. Take any sutra. Look at the great Mahavakyas. The Mahavakyas, each one taken from one Veda, they are fundamental to the Advaitic perception. Prajnanam Brahma, Tattva Masi, Aham Brahmosmi, I am Atma Brahma. These are the four fundamental Mahavakyas. Well, what is the first one? Prajnanam Brahma. It is a definition or what you call Lakshana Vakya. Tattva Masi is Upadesa Vakya. Aham Brahmosmi is Anusandana Vakya. I am Atma Brahma is Anubhava Vakya or Anubhuti Vakya. See, how do you arrive at all these things? The statement and what follows and the ultimate statement as Aham Brahmosmi. Aham Brahmosmi is not a statement, it is an experience. And experience cannot be stated and experience can only be experienced. God is such an experience. His qualities are an experience. That is why when you take the interpretation Ramanuja again and again comes back to this, the Pramanic value. Even when he speaks about the Sattva with the Anubhavati in his Sivashya, they are objections. They are not rejections. We must be very clear that Ramanuja is not indulging any, in any polemics. He does not deny. He does not contend. He only says, this is the interpretation. The other interpretation cannot be accepted for these reasons. He does not, it is absurd. He does not say that. The Sattva is the Anubhati. Everywhere. Again, again, he comes back and says, well, these are things which you have to come to terms with when you want to interpret this. That is where you find the genius. Look at these uh, three sentences we are all seeing. So, when you take this, the first one, Kapyasam Puddhari Kameva. What is the text? We saw. Adjective. Perhaps it is an adjective to another adjective. Or there are two adjectives which go to the principal subject or principal noun. When there is a sequence of adjectives, that which is closest to the noun has the greatest bearing. The one which is further away has got lesser bearing. Like that it goes on. What was the context? The context was, the context is not merely the physical context, the temporal context. It is also the ethical and the context of ideas. Context of ideas is very important. There is another famous example. Uh, which is uh, quoted by Parasar Bhatta. Vijita Atma, Vijaya Atma. Vijita Atma, Vijaya Atma. He says, Vijita Atma, Avijaya Atma. Because in Sanchez Samasa, the A will disappear. When you break, you can add A or you can leave it out. But whether you add or leave it out depends upon what the context means. See, Sardaya Adeyam, Asardaya Adeyam. The organist says, Sardaya Adeyam, Asardaya Adeyam, Sriya Adeyam, Sriya Adeyam, Piya Adeyam. Samhita Adeyam. Sardaya Adeyam or Sardaya Adeyam. You have to look at the context. When everything is give, 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 how can you say give without interest? Asardaya. It can only be Sardaya Adeyam. It can only be Asardaya Adeyam. In a similar way, there, Vijita Atma, Vidaya Atma. Shankara's philosophy as Vidaya is not acceptable. That's why it becomes avideya for him. Whereas Parasarabhata says, God is both the conqueror and the conquered. Which is Atma? Videya Atma. Avideya is one who cannot be a Videya as a servant. Which is Atma? One who conquers everything. But Ramana says, or Vishnathaji philosophy says, Parasarabhata later comments upon it, Bahadur Nadarpan. And he says, Vijita Atma, Videya Atma. Because if Krishna could show his cosmic form, the same Krishna was sitting at the lower level driving the horses in the chariot. That is Vijita Atma, this is Vijaya Atma. How can there be Vijaya from here? Or when he gives the instruction of Ashtachara in Naranarayana, in Badri, and when he sits and learns Srivasya in Tirukurunguri, 
where is Vishwatma, where is Hidaya. So, the interpretation itself is based upon the subtext that you bring to it. How could Ramanuja give these interpretations when Dramadachari has given a different interpretation? Shankari interpretations are different. How could he bring it? Because he belongs to a tradition, hermeneutic. In our tradition, as Ramati himself says, as all of us know, Ramanuja was not enunciating a new philosophy. He was not setting up a new system. Of course, the others also are doing only that because he got it from Gaudapada or Govindapada or whatever it is. Here, he belongs to that tradition. He brings that particular uh, attitude and through that he is able to understand. So, when you take these examples, you are able to see how he has got the genius. I will go a bit further and go into the commentarial aspect of it, taking the Nalaya Prabhupada. Many people say that Ramanuja has not commented on Nalaya Prabhupada. He has again and again gone back only to the Sanskrit text. There is a Radhartha Sangram, there is a Gita Sangram, there is a, a Sri Vashyam. All those things are there. But has he commented on? Well, there are opinions about it. Though it is said that Tirukulai Puran Pudlan wrote the first Eid Arayar Padi only under his direction and it met with his approval. Therefore, it can be taken that he has commented on that also. And the way he was learning it also narrates a few things and thereby hangs a tale. He was asked to learn Narayana Prabhupada from Thirumalayanda. He goes to Thirumalayanda and Thirumalayanda begins the lessons. Whenever he says something, Ramanuja differs from him. He gets angry. Do you know? How can you say this? Did Aravinda say that? I have never heard him say that. In this quarrel, it will stop. It happened once, it happened twice. On the second occasion, when this confrontation arose, how do you say that? Well, that is what Aravinda has said. You have not even seen Aravinda. When you went there, he had achieved Paramapada. How can you He says, I am Aravinda Sehkalavya. I am the uninitiated. Perhaps I have been uh, given distance education. <laughs> we have to put it only that way. By distance education, I have learnt it. Two famous examples are mentioned in uh, Guru Parampara. I will take them. One is, Ariya Kalatulle Adimekan Andusayvith Ariya Mayate Adiyane Vaitaya. I will give the translation of it as had been given by Anda, that is Thirumala Anda, in his explanation. At the time, when darkness had not enveloped me, you cast me into the world of fleeting pleasures. At the time when darkness had not enveloped the moment I was born, at that time itself you put me into samsara. This was not acceptable to Ramanuja. What does he say? Only the Anvaya, the sequence of words he changes. Ariya Mayati Ariyane, Ariya Kalatulle, Adimekan, Anbusai Vitu Itayal. Translated, the ignorant self of mine was rescued from the darkness and bathed in your torrent of love. See how he translates one into the other. That's why he said he turns the meaning upon its head. Ariya Kalatulle, Adimekan, Anbusai Vitu, Ariya Mayati Adiyane Vaitu. You put me into this bottomless mitya, suffering, samsara. No, God never did this. Then what did he do? Just a rearrangement of the words. The meaning changes. Ariya mayati ariyane, ariya kala tulle, adimikan andu sayyati, vaitayal. The other one, yakkalat yandaya yandul bandil, matri yakkalatilum yadandrum vendayam. Yakalatu Yandaya Yenul Manil Matri Yakalatrum Yadan Rum Vendayan. The sentence as interpreted by Anda, if at any time you enter me, I would not ask for it again. That is self contradictory with the statement. If at any time you enter me, I wouldn't ask for it again. But Ramanaja says, this again the rearrangement of words. 
எக்காலத்து எந்தையாய் மண்ணில் எக்காலத்திலும் மற்ற யாதென்றும் வேண்டேன் எக்காலத்து எந்தையாய் மண்ணில் இஃப் யூ என்டர் இன் டு மீ எக்காலத்து மற்ற யாதன் ஐ ஒன் யூன் ஆசர் மோக்ஷா ஐ ஒன் ஆசர் எனி கிஃப் ஃப்ரம் யூ ட்ரான்ஸ்லேட்டர் இஃப் யூ என்டர் மீ ஒன்ஸ் ஐ வில் நாட் ஆஸ் ஃபார் எனிதிங் எல்ஸ் அட் எனி டைம் இஃப் யூ என்டர் மீ ஒன்ஸ் ஐ வில் நாட் ஆஸ் ஃபார் எனிதிங் எல்ஸ் அட் எனி டைம் சி டூ யூ கால் திஸ் கமெண்டேரியல் எஸ் பிகாஸ் நாட் தட் தி ஏர்லியர் மீனிங் டஸ் நாட் எக்ஸிஸ்ட் இட் இஸ் ஆல்சோ பாசிபிள் தட் இஸ் வை ஆண்டர் ஹஸ் இட் இட் பட் சப்டர் சி பிரிங்ஸ் the cortex that he brings the tradition the upbringing his instruction from his own masters they all bring unto him this meaning and this meaning should be taken without rejecting the first one that's why i said because when you read a line this is going a bit into again uh, sahitya and uh, alankara there is what is called dhvani dhvani is suggestion ananda varna speaks about dhvani in his dhanya loka in dhanya loka he says the statement also suggests if there is a suggested meaning take that meaning and negate the stated meaning the beautiful examples are taken for the number of uh, uh, literally difficult is that ganga yamuna is the example that is taken the cottage on the ganges the cottage on the ganges is a statement but there cannot be a cottage on the ganges it means on the banks of the ganges so how you cannot take that as a literal meaning you have to take a suggested meaning translation works some difficulties there because on the ganges is the english idiom <laughs> you cannot take it but on if you take it literally as being on topological and not positionally it is on the river is topological it is on the back is positional you have to take the positional suggestion rejecting the on topological suggestion then only it will mean but that meaning gets postponed to this that is the stated meaning gets postponed to this but he says reject the stated meaning accept the suggested meaning but derrida he says you can't reject it you don't have to reject it you go on adding to it more and more meanings it becomes a layer it becomes structured it becomes a system of meaning we have to be very careful about this word system system has got two adjectives one is systematic the other is systemic systematic is what you impose upon it system is how it reveals itself one leads on to the other that on to the other that on to the other there is no stopping it whereas in systematic you do this now you go to the next whereas in systeming you don't say stop you go on to the next it goes on by itself such a systemic structure that's why literary interpretation in the pramanic sense is a systemic interpretation and not a systematic interpretation systematic interpretation again and again will come and land itself in linguistics or in logic or in semiotics but systemic logic systemic interpretation will be guided by your core text it will take you from one level to the other level from that level to the next level like that ramanuja has displayed a very great genius see when i speak about derrida he is less than 100 years old but our acharya is 1000 years old he does not mean that he has used these terms he has not used text to context core text and this and all that because he is not interested in the structure he is interested in the system through the systemic examination of the statements in the pramanas be they the upanishads or even if it is the sarvika shastra the bhagavad sutras or even the bhagavad gita how many interpretation the bhagavad gita are there exposing the greatness of the genius the interpreter that Ramana Javas. So, one aspect of it we saw the other day when we saw his genius as the Thirupa Vijaya. Today, we are able to see a few things. We are only skimming on the surface. We will have to adopt a statement from Newton who said, we are like children 
playing with the pebbles upon the shore where the whole sea lies before you undiscovered unfathomable mysterious enticing but always challenging enticing you that is what the kalyana gunas of the lord are and they have to be brought out only through such interpretation of men like no of acharyas like ramanuja thank you